Hey everybody, uh, this week we are looking at location. Um, fascinating concept. As I got into sort of researching, just found some really good uh, resources, uh, just get you thinking about stuff. So let's jump into it. All right, I want to start right here. Before we begin our discussion of these specific concepts, let's kind of remember what we're doing. Okay, so we're talking about a business. Okay, uh, going back to Adam Smith that you know, take the excess that you produce above and beyond what you need yourself, take it into a common marketplace. And then there'll be others in that common marketplace, hopefully, that'll all be able to trade with each other. So it only works if they're profitable exchanges with external others, meaning other people. You don't sell within your own family, you're just kind of trading it around. So profitable, meaning that uh, the, the revenue that you're bringing in is above and beyond your cost okay so that's that excess revenue and then it's with other people and so the the, the resources and, and money is is trading around between different entities and not within the same entity um, also this idea of game theory I brought that up just briefly when we talked about the four P's okay and this one location place this is part of that place um, I'm gonna post a, a wonderful video from ABC News that, that's a really good example of game theory. So you, you need to be where, the, where your people expect you to be. And so you have to kind of figure out what they expect and then you need to be there to meet them. And then it's also so much more. So it's gonna be brand, it's gonna be image, it's gonna be you know just what, what you're able to charge, just the whole feel, all of that is gonna be wrapped up in this place dimension. Okay, another one of these kind of classic uh, relationships that comes up when you talk about location is the trade-off of location versus advertising. So if you're in a really good location, there are a lot of people who come by, they see you there every day. Um, you don't have to do a lot to attract uh, people to come in uh, or to go buy your place. That's a really good location. And usually those locations are gonna cost more. You know, back in the old days when shopping malls were a big deal, uh, that, that was one of the advantages that the, the mall brings in all these customers, the stores that are in the mall or a certain type of store. Again, going back to that game theory, uh, they're, they're the type of stores that would be appealing to people who go to malls. And so uh, businesses that locate on busy streets or busy intersections or close to other uh, businesses, those are going to have more visibility. They're gonna have more traffic. When people think, you know, where do we need to go to find this? There's a certain place. If you're there, then that's gonna be a better location for you. Some of them are not gonna be as good. And uh, usually these are ones that uh, maybe the rent, the, the lease, the, the price to purchase is, is gonna be a little better for you. You might be tempted to do that, uh, to jump into something that doesn't require as much financial commitment, especially as you're getting started. But realize that when you're off the beaten path, you're gonna to have to spend more resources, more time, okay? Uh, getting people continually, that's why I put continued need for advertising. You have to constantly remind people that you exist and to tell them where you are because they're not driving by and seeing you every day or walking by and seeing you every day that, that you need to remind them that you are there and for them to be able to find you. Signage, you're gonna to have to make yourself, it's gonna be very, it needs to be very noticeable uh, when people are near you or do drive by you, what you're doing. So that's that classic trade-off between location, good location. You usually have to don't have to spend as much on advertising, making making people aware that you exist and and that you were there. If you're kind of off the beaten path, maybe not as good a location, then you are going to have to invest in more time and resources and letting people know that you are there. Okay. So as we go through this, uh, those are just some key ideas uh, that are going to kind of drive this. All right, uh, Entrepreneur Magazine. Like I mentioned before, when I've done this uh, with undergraduate students, I actually used a book that was put out by Entrepreneur. And so that's just kind of the first place that I think of going to look uh, when trying to find these ideas. So I've pulled from about four different articles and I've got them cited. Again, they, uh, these, these slides, when they have the Entrepreneur, these are just things that I borrowed straight from them. It, it's just really good information. Okay, so on this one, uh, how to find the right location for your store. This one I, I, I grabbed out in particular because of the city. So this gives some ideas when you're choosing, let's analyze your city. So it talks about the size of the city's trading area, the population, population trends, is it growing, is it changing? 
if it is growing, how is it growing? Uh, if it's if it's declining, how? Why is it declining? The total purchasing power and who has it within this city, within this uh, trade area. Uh, what are the? It talks about the total retail trade potential for different lines of trade, the number and size of competition, and then the quality and aggressiveness. So. Again, choosing location, analyze the city and your trade area first, and then we can get into some specifics looking at locations. Okay, so this one, here's another one, again, from uh, Entrepreneur Magazine. Favorable signs when looking for a location. You're looking for healthy. You're looking for growth. You're looking for uh, an, an economy that would welcome and be able to support a new member to be able to trade. And as a new member, you're helping the economy grow as well. So some of the signs uh, mentioned in this article, look are other stores opening, chain stores, department stores, uh, branches of large industrial firms, are they locating in the community? The Chamber of Commerce, um, other civic organizations, are they welcoming of business and small business? And what are they doing to help recruit companies and others and resources into the communities? Good schools, public services to bring in families, to bring in people who are gonna work, uh, that, that they have the access to good public services, uh, good opportunities within the cities. A well-maintained business and residential premises is, does it look healthy and vibrant or does it look like, like it's, it's diminishing and, and possibly dying? Good transportation facilities, okay? Are resources gonna be able to come in? Are completed products gonna be able to go out? And that could be heavy industrial stuff. It could be airplanes, it could be uh, trucking, uh, all, all the different types of transportation. Could be ships, uh, depending on where, where you're located. And then construction activity. Uh, are things growing? Are, they, are, are new things starting? Are there a lot of vacant buildings and unoccupied houses? Uh, again, just kind of the state of the city. All right, this next one. So specifically now, looking for a location within the store. Again, a wonderful article uh, from Entrepreneur Magazine. So customer attraction paper, the nature of competition. We've got some, uh, and some of these are gonna repeat. That's, that's kind of, and you're able to read these. Uh, that competition one, sometimes it says, you wanna be right next to your competition because when the competition is advertising and they're doing things to attract people, if you're sitting pretty close and can offer a really close substitute, uh, that they could be helping you out. Uh, and also that idea of be where they expect you to be. So if they expect to go to one place to look for something and you're really close by, then you're there too. Uh, availability of access routes to the stores. We've seen these. I don't know if you're like me, but you know there are times where I get gas going to school. I'm not gonna do that coming home because it's on the wrong side of the road. Um, it's hard to get into this corner. It's hard to get out. If I you know, go into this particular place, then how do I get out and not have to cut across traffic? So, you know, those are some of those, those issues that you need to think about and address as you're analyzing locations. Zoning regulations, we've already brought those up, uh, that make sure that you are able to operate your business in that particular part of town. Uh, geographic direction of the city's expansion. So if you're up on the north side and everything's growing down to the south, might you find yourself up there by yourself uh, down the road. So again, just, just a general understanding of, of what's going on before choosing your place. The general appearance of the area, of, of your location, but also of the street, of the neighborhood. Drive around, uh, drive around at different times of day, see what it looks like. Uh, it talks about sales and traffic growth prospects of the traffic of the area, and then the demographics of the neighborhoods, uh, those areas around your business. So again, just wonderful. I think a lot of these are, I don't wanna say common sense, they're probably things that we kind of understand intuitively, but this course, what we're doing here is bringing this out and really trying to make sense of it. So when we do have to perform this type of analysis, we really kind of have an idea of what to go look for. Okay, here's another one. Okay, so uh, again, another entrepreneur uh, list. Uh, when narrowing down, so you've chosen maybe several uh, good possibilities. They said narrow them down by looking at the traffic flow. When is it heavy? When is it not heavy? Um, which way does it move? Are there going to be problems getting in and out? Uh, complementary nature of neighboring stores. So if you've got neighbors, are those neighbors also going to bring in people who might be able to come in and trade with you as well and vice versa? 
parking. Parking is a big deal. That's something that I wrestled with with my little place. Uh, you need to have enough parking. It needs to be easy to get in and in out and that you don't uh, bonk into each other when you're in the parking lot. Uh, vulnerability. How vulnerable are you to competition? If you do locate here, uh, what if one uh, big competitor comes in just right down the street? Might they uh, hurt you? And then what is the cost? Just what is the cost of the site? And that can be to purchase uh, or could be to lease. All right, some more things. Again, these these are just kind of a lot of these kind of repeat, uh, but I wanted to include them all along. So that style of operation, specifically they talk about, you know, how are you going to do this? What is your feel going to be? Um, are you going to have a standalone? Are you going to be a kiosk in a mall? Um, are you going to advertise yourself to look one way or, or perhaps a different way? And so make sure that that uh, the site, the location is going to be able to support that. Uh, your demographics, again, we've already mentioned, foot traffic, accessibility, parking. And I'm going to bring up accessibility here uh, on another slide in just a minute. There's your competition, other, business, other businesses and services, the image and history of the site. So I think we can all think, if we've lived in a town for a while, we can think of a business that has just been one business after another. We were back in Abilene. There was an old pizza place that has been probably a dozen things uh, while we lived there. And most of the time it was just empty. We noticed that it had been knocked down. Someone has just kind of given up on it and hopefully we'll try something new and interesting that would draw people in. But, you know, think about that. There was a, there was a corner site at one of the entrances to the highway that ran through Abilene that was just one thing after another. And finally Chick-fil-A came in and just knocked it down and put up a Chick-fil-A which then <laughs> created traffic flow issues uh, getting on and off the highway. There's your ordinances, the building's infrastructure. And again, this is one of the reasons I wanted to include this list. So you go into a really neat historic building, but maybe it's not wired properly to be able to support the, the needs that we have now in today's world with computers and lighting, electronics and other things. Um, and then utilities, what are the utility bills gonna be? I had a little branch location in a neighboring town and I didn't realize that we got in there, but it had a weird air conditioning system uh, and it was under a commercial account. So simply turning on the air conditioning, I got charged about $300 a month just for turning it on. Once it was delivered, uh, the electricity was delivered, it was delivered. It was really intended for someone who would be in there almost 24 hours a day uh, running electricity rather than just eight or 12 hours a week. And then those other costs, you know, if you have shared cost for maintenance, for janitorial, janitorial for security, uh, you got to know what those things are up front. All right. So again, there's the list of 10. We've already kind of brought up some of those, but then it did bring in some new ones in here to consider and things that we must be aware of. All right. Now here's the big list. So this is a great one and I don't need to go through all of them. You can, you, your eyeballs are quicker reading them and processing them uh, than, than I'm able to go through them. But this is a list. Uh, it's about 22 uh, by Karen Spader. So they talk about zoning. Is it big enough? Uh, if you're going to do retail, if you're going to have office, if you're going to have storage, if you're going to have a workroom, if you're going to have changing rooms in particular, does it have enough space? The layout requirements, is the shape of it what it needs to be? Does the building need any repairs? I've had to deal with, with a flat roof and an old air conditioning system, and, and that's kind of a pain. Um, do the utilities, the lighting, the heating, the cooling, all meet your needs, or are you going to have to rewire, bring things up to code, and uh, and just increase the maybe the power of the air conditioner? Uh, lease terms, rent terms, favorable. We'll come back to those uh, in a few weeks when we talk about leasing versus buying. Is it convenient to where you live? It's amazing how many times you have to run over there just to check on things. Are you going to have a, Are you in a good place for qualified employees? Um, are your customers nearby? Uh, again, that population density. Yeah, there are a few, but are there enough? Are there enough to regularly come in and do business with you to make it worthwhile? Um, is it seasonal? So we've got a little uh, place up in the mountains and it is seasonal. <laughs> so in the winter, there are a lot of people there skiing. And in the summer, there are not as many people there doing mountain biking. Uh, you know, skipping down a couple, is it consistent with your image? Is it located in a safe neighborhood? Uh, is there enough exterior lighting? So if you're coming and going, especially when the time changes, are people going to feel safe uh, coming and going? Uh, that last one, are neighboring businesses likely to attract uh, other customers and might they help uh, bring some people in, into your homes as well? And then this, this next one, uh, 
are there any competitors located close? And if so, are you going to be able to compete with them? Is it, here's, the, here's where I put that ADU. Is the facility easily accessible to your potential customers? Now, the way I read that, okay, can they get in and out? Uh, I had an experience which made me a lot more appreciative and aware of ADA uh, standards and, and compliance. Uh, shortly after moving to Oklahoma, I ruptured my Achilles tendon. And for months, and it was my right leg, I couldn't drive. But being on crutches, being on a scooter, being in a boot uh, for months, I uh, became keenly aware of accessibility issues. And so that's something we need to be aware of having a business, that we are going to be accessible to everybody and to make sure that the facility is made to support that. So parking space, uh, public transportation. So in some parts of the country, um, I'm thinking, you know, trips to New York City, to Washington, D.C. In Europe, uh, where we have public transportation, you want to be kind of close. Uh, in the U.S., depending on where you're located, there are going to be different issues that come into play. Uh, can suppliers make deliveries? All right, they're going to be able to back in. Is there enough room for that? And then if you want to expand, if it comes to a point where you will need to expand, will your current facility allow for that to happen? So just, again, just a great list of really nuts and bolts questions, specific questions that you must run through and think about as you're choosing the perfect place uh, to do your business. All right, I wanted to throw this in before we moved into the internet. So pretty much uh, that list, the list that we've just gone through are from what we call the bricks and mortar, the traditional building uh, where you would do business. If you're doing a service, you know, if you had a plumber, uh, if, you, if you're an electrician, if you were going out, maybe doing IT calls where you just needed a facility to kind of locate your headquarters and to have all of your stuff. But then you've got people going out and uh, performing the service, doing business elsewhere. That's something different. So a lot of that stuff, in my mind, I was kind of thinking retail or service. Uh, but again, there are so many different types of businesses and the facilities that are going to be required are so different. All right. Let's go back. I looked this up. Uh, while making this presentation, Sears Roebuck. Okay, so I think my generation, so I was born in 1966, and I think kind of the cool thing about my generation is we were kind of the last one kind of of the old world, <laughs> the way things used to be, but then we're also kind of the first ones into the new world. And so this internet world and, and this, you know, the ability to connect and do business and uh, communicate and send money and products, you know, over, over the web, instantly doing what we're doing right now. We couldn't do this when I was a kid. We couldn't even do this when I was in college. We're, we're at a neat time. But you know, if you think back to Sears Roebuck, Sears and Roebuck Company, when I was a kid, the catalogs, uh, the catalog, what it allowed businesses to do is to take their products and instead of just doing business with people who could walk into the store, it allowed them to list out all the things that they had and then mail it to them. And then, and then customers in different places could then look at that catalog, see what was offered, and maybe they could buy stuff that wasn't offered in their local market, but they could through Sears and then have it shipped. And so the catalog sales, it, it was kind of a groundbreaking idea that we don't just have to limit our business to those people who can come into our shop or that I can go to their home or to their shop and fix things and offer my services, but it allowed the ability to sell to a much broader market. So if you think about those catalogs, let, let's go back to the actual printed catalogs. And I remember as a kid looking at these things, it was always a big deal going to Sears when the new catalogs came out. But there's some issues with it, which have been revolved, uh, revised and improved uh, through the internet. So catalogs, you know, to actually produce a catalog, it had to be designed. So someone had to get all the information, they had to type it all out. They had to put pictures. They had to make this thing. And then they had to print it. And then they had to distribute it out. So you think about the marginal cost. What's the cost of making one more catalog? Well, the design's already taken care of, but the printing and the distribution. All right, so it could be expensive. If you were shipping one of these big, thick catalogs through to mail to people just all over the country, that could be a sizable cost. The thing is with printed inventories and prices, once those things are printed, they really become obsolete. So it's just a snapshot of prices and inventories at one point in time when they're produced. But there were times I remember ordering stuff as a kid and finding out later that it was out of stock and that it wasn't available 
and maybe it was on back order if we wanted it to be back ordered. Payments back then were different. A lot of times we would have a little envelope and we would write a check and include a little order form with what we wanted and put the check in and we would mail it. And then we'd have to sit around maybe for weeks until it actually arrived. Um, with credit cards, then things became a little different. And maybe even the ability, you get the printed catalog, but then like L.L. Bean and Land's End and some of those where you could actually get the printed catalog, but then they had a phone number. And so you could call the phone number and talk to someone, tell them what you wanted, give them your credit card, and they would ship it. All right, that was a different way to do it. But that time to receive, you just knew that if you were going to order something that wasn't available locally, you were going to have to sit around and wait for it. Two to three weeks, four weeks, it could be a while. Then things changed. With, with the advent of the internet, e-commerce, we can now have an online catalog that is, can always be updated. And if you think about the cost of the online catalog, okay, it's really just in the design. You design the website. Yes, there are going to be costs associated with the e-commerce, but really to get it into the hands of another person is, is pretty much zero. You design the catalog. You don't have to print it. You don't have to mail it. Anybody with the web address can log in and see what you have. And hopefully your inventory would be integrated to show real-time inventory, and then the cost would be updated as well. Um, prices, like I said, just real-time and updated. Instant payments, you can put it on credit cards. You can do other things. Time to receive with um, Amazon Prime and other things. Kind of the, the creative and interesting kind of groundbreaking thing about Prime was it guarantees that that two-day delivery for everybody. So Amazon at the beginning had a deal where if you spent $25 or more, then you could get faster shipping. But with Prime, you're kind of prepaying uh, for your shipping. Here in Oklahoma City, we have a huge big Amazon distribution center over by the airport, which is actually real close to my full-time school. So a lot of times a two-day delivery is actually kind of slow around here. A lot of times it'll come the next day. So, you know, compared to what it used to be, weeks at a time and we weren't really sure if it was actually going to come this you can actually pay and and you know if you order before so and so o'clock at night it'll be delivered either the next day or the day after and they'll bring it right to your door that's pretty cool so so with those ideas let, let's talk about some other types of location okay so in the world of e-commerce so maybe you have a standalone business but you're also doing online sales as well or maybe you're just purely an online business as well. So these are some things that I brought up, the kind of things came out of my head, uh, and then I'll give you some other ideas coming up on this. So standalone, if you think that about the idea of a standalone business versus a mall, like a shopping mall. Again, the shopping mall, the advantage of a bricks and mortar mall, the, the advantage is that people come there. They, they know that what they wanna do is mall stuff, and the things they're looking for are found at the mall. So they go to the mall and they wander around and they can shop and it, it's kind of all there and they have the ability to easily jump between stores, maybe compare prices. That's the advantage of a mall. Standalone business, again, that location is not as good. You're kind of off by yourself. You have to spend more time, more energy, making people aware that you're there. If you think about a standalone website versus what I'm calling an online mall website, Okay, the standalone website. So if you build your own thing, you're, it's, like, it's kind of like the bad look. The bad thing about the Internet is people don't drive by it. You know, you just don't randomly drive by and, and see your online store there. They have to be drawn into it somehow. So with the standalone, you have to create awareness. So that search engine optimization, making sure that your place, your services, your business is going to appear in searches and related searches. Uh, you're going to have to spend resources and time and energy on advertising, just like you would with a bricks and mortar kind of off by yourself. Partnerships and links. So find other ones and share, kind of like sharing phone numbers. You know, make, make a network uh, with others. So if someone comes to one place, that they then can link over to your place as well. You have to create awareness. That idea of consumer trust. So if I'm going to buy something, you know, I'm interested in finding something maybe from my truck. And so I just Google it and I find a company that sells this thing, but it's a company I've never heard of and it's in a weird location. And I look at their website and I'm just not sure, or I could get it through something on Amazon or through maybe eBay, something that I'm more familiar with and that I know uh, has some security for me, not only for my payment and my 
information, but also what happens if, if it actually doesn't come to me? Uh, what happens if I have to return it? So uh, with a standalone, you have to invest time and energy in building that trust with new people, not just the continuing customers, but the new people uh, that who come in there that first time. And then if you do it yourself, that idea of building and maintaining an e-commerce website. Now, yes, you can con contract with a, a, another professional website designer, e-commerce company who can do that for you, but you're gonna have to stay in touch with them and you're gonna have to keep things updated. Okay, you're gonna have to spend time investing in all three of those, awareness, trust, and the website, if you're doing it by yourself. The other thing you can do are these idea of what I call an online mall. And so you go to a place where other people are already shopping. And so brand awareness, shared promotion, you know, if you're looking for something in this world that we live in, Amazon is a big one, Etsy is a big one, eBay is a big one, and I'll show you some more on the next slide. Uh, but the advantage of, of those websites is that customers are already coming in. They are already there shopping and you can list your goods among the ones that are already offered. Uh, so with that competitors and substitutes, so just like it said uh, with, a, with a physical location, sometimes it's good to be near competitors because when people come over there looking for their stuff, they can see your stuff and think, hey, that's a substitute. That one would be just as good as well. Um, established business models. So with Amazon, with eBay, eBay, they've got kind of rules and procedures. They've been around for a while. They've kind of endured the test of time, at least as far as <laughs> this time period goes. And, and they, they kind of know what they're doing. They're experts in the process. And then uh, the last one I put, power and resources to maintain the e-commerce website and to innovate, to continually come up with new ways of doing things and stay cutting edge with the technology and, and ones who are experts in drawing in people and, and making recommendations, cookies, all that other stuff uh, that they are experts in doing. So that's the advantage of the online mall. Standalones, again, you can do it yourself. You can do it yourself, um, on, or you may also wanna do it in the mall as well. That's the neat thing about being in the online environment. You can do it in both, <laughs> okay? Um, and, then, and then this one. So here are the online malls that I wanted to describe. So we know uh, probably all of us uh, have, have run across Amazon. My dad, so I've, we've kind of used all of these as, as I was typing them up and just kind of thinking through these. My family, we, we've really used all of these. So my, my father was a journalism professor at the University of Florida. And when he retired, he started writing books and wrote a bunch of them. And he bought a lot of books to do the research to write his books. And when the book was over with, uh, when he was done writing, he didn't need all of his resource materials. So he actually resold used books, the ones that he had used for his research on Amazon. So in the Sunday reflection for this week, I want you to research what it is, what's, what's required to join the Amazon mall and go in and look at the merchant services, merchant accounts, and how you would do that. What's eligible to be sold, what's not. Look at the fees, all of, all of those concepts. eBay. So eBay, uh, I actually got a one of those little recognition. I got on eBay way back at the beginning, way back before PayPal became a thing, way back before we really knew how to pay people, um, way back before a lot of businesses got on. And really that uh, C2C, consumer to consumer, that's where one person would sell to another. I bought a lot of racquetball rackets from people, um, <laughs> new and, and old, just a, all kind of weird, weird stuff that people had and they didn't want to just give it away. Uh, maybe someone in their local market wasn't really interested in that, but someone else like me uh, at a weird place in a weird time of day uh, would, would get up and bid on that thing. And so eBay, uh, consumer, consumer to consumer, business to consumer. So you can, as a business, you can put your stuff on and sell as well. And then also business to business. So uh, my son has, has always been kind of entrepreneurial. Uh, when he was little, he would buy little uh, power balance bracelets and he'd, he'd import them from overseas uh, for about a dollar and a quarter a piece. And he'd flip them and sell them for about five dollars a piece. Uh, he bought Rubik's Cubes. He'd buy six packs of Rubik's Cubes uh, for about twenty dollars, really nice ones. And then he'd flip them and sell them for ten dollars a piece and give little lessons on how to do things. Uh, one of my kids, uh, the Baja hoodies, kind of the um, we like them when it, when it starts getting cold but the kind of knit hoodies, uh, my kids outgrew them. And so we got on eBay and instead of just buying one, 
we ended up buying a bunch uh, that came in from El Paso. We bought about 36 of them, and then we were able to flip those and sell them and get our money back and still all have kind of a, a wonderful collection of hoodies as well. We've sold instruments, uh, musical instruments. We'll, we'll find instruments at pawn shops, at garage sales, um, at Goodwill, on sometimes on eBay, other places. And we'll, we'll kind of research, know what they are. We'll buy them if they're in good shape. And we think we can make a profit, we'll flip them. And so then we'll, we'll put them back up on eBay or other places. eBay comes in with fees. So again, I'll, I want you to research and understand what that is. Uh, I produced college apparel for a couple of years for, for different schools and actually had an eBay store where I was able to list all my inventory, got a better deal uh, with a store. So just all kind of wonderful opportunities available through Amazon and available through eBay to small business owners or bigger scale business owners who want different markets to be able to uh, create profitable exchanges with external others. Etsy, uh, so Etsy is one that my daughter actually has a shop. And so she makes, uh, she's very artistic, very gifted, very creative. So she'll make different jewelry and paintings and hand lettering and just all kinds of neat artsy things. And then she has created an Etsy store with all of her inventory and is able to create exchanges through with customers just from all over the place. But she doesn't have to deal with the e-commerce stuff. She just gets her fee and then ships. Uh, actually, with eBay, they had a, a book site uh, a long time ago, and I actually sold uh, books through eBay as well. And it was always kind of fun logging on my computer in the morning and, hey, you got an order from so-and-so, and they had already paid me. And so I went on and uh, made up the shipping label and would take those books down and sell them as well. Facebook Marketplace. So this is actually kind of in, in this world is actually kind of a new one. And I really see it as more of a consumer to consumer. I, I honestly haven't gone in and looked at the terms and conditions for being able to sell, but we have sold a lot of stuff and actually bought a lot of stuff from other people who were wanting to get rid of stuff. When we made our move from Texas to Oklahoma, uh, I offered my boys the opportunity to, in, instead of getting a, a job during the summer, why don't they sell some of the stuff that we're finding in our garage and storage unit and selling that and flipping it? So we just sold from little, you know, stuff uh, that they had as little kids, uh, stuff that we had found. We, we found a receiver hitch for a, a Jeep Liberty, like a 2011 Jeep Liberty, for some reason was out in our alleyway. And so we brought that in. My son stuck it on, on Facebook Marketplace and we sold it for $60. And some people came by to pick it up. You can also do shipping now through Facebook Marketplace. And they've actually got a pretty good system where the buyer will pay and that is kind of held in escrow until the shipper then actually goes and uh, gets a mailing label and enters the, uh, the, the number on there to show that it's, that it's coming, that's gonna be delivered. And then the money then comes back to your bank account. So interesting, we're in an interesting world. And again, we can do those trades with people around the world. Uh, I found a uh, unicycle, a big fat wheeled unicycle. The Goodwill stores have uh, a common auction site it's called shopgoodwill.com. So instead of going through eBay, they got to the place where they wanted to make kind of their own standalone, but for all the Goodwills. We won uh, a unicycle that was up in Wisconsin. and we. We, we contracted with a uh, one of those pack and mail places to go pick it up and then mail it down to us. So it's just amazing what we can do now uh, with this internet technology, computer information technology that we couldn't do really just a few years ago. And then Alibaba, if you're not familiar with that, uh, that is a kind of a international marketplace to connect manufacturers and the people who wanna sell. Uh, so really I call that B2B. I got linked up with them. I was looking for, actually looking for uh, someone to help me manufacture martial arts uniforms. And so I got on Alibaba and got connected with a guy uh, over in the Middle East and it turned out to be a disaster, uh, but I paid through PayPal and was able to get my money back through an appeal. So you just have to be aware, aware of all this. And really when you go into it, uh, because you're not looking the person in the face, you're, you're dealing remotely with someone who's just typing you messages. That's some hard, sometimes hard to gauge the honesty and integrity of these people. So just make sure you're covered uh, that, you know, let the buyer beware, uh, do your due diligence on all of these different dimensions. So, so that's it for now. Um, just a lot of good stuff, interesting, fascinating stuff. 
and we all of us we are in this really neat period in history where we can do this stuff and do things that have never been done before so that idea of traditional uh, bricks and mortar a building for your location that that's also critically important but we also have this ability to trade and interact with each other through these online catalogs in real time with real payments and really fast shipping and communication so that's that for now uh, again we'll have some good review and discussion questions that sunday reflection will ask you to kind of dive back into your idea for the business and help define how these issues apply specifically to your idea so that's it thanks